Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this important webinar. My name is Stephanie Sargent with SC Healthcare and today we'll be discussing physician and provider burnout and this topic could not be more timely than now. Along with COVID-19, burnout is at an all-time high in the U.S. and could possibly worsen over the next few months. Today, our presenters will cover the burnout basics, what it is and what it isn't, and include actions that individuals as well as healthcare leaders can take to impact the dilemma. Our presenters will speak for about 30 minutes and at the end, we'll take Q&A. So I encourage everyone to please submit questions for, via the questions box in the control panel at any time during the presentation and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Our presenters today are Dr. Maisha Esco and Dr. Kevin Moser. Dr. Esco is a vascular surgeon and locums tenens physician for the past five years. Along with a BS in molecular biology, she completed a MD, PhD program in cell biology. She is also a former major in the United States Air Force, a yoga teacher, world traveler, and a mountaineer. Dr. Kevin Moser is SC Healthcare's senior medical consultant, but before that, he was the CEO of Wellspan Health, a health system of eight hospitals with 200 ambulatory sites and 1,000 physicians. Over his 30 years of experience with Wellspan, he served in many other capacities, including executive director of a medical group, president of Wellspan Gettysburg Hospital, where he led the hospital to be named the top 100 performance improvement leader for two consecutive years, and executive vice president and chief operating officer. Myself, I'm the VP of Product Development and Quality at SC Healthcare. I'm a nurse who practiced many years at the bedside, including some amazing time as a traveling nurse. But the past 12 years, I've spent working with, within hospital administration. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Black Bell, and I most recently served as the Patient Safety Program Manager at the Medical University of South Carolina, which is a large health system in Charleston, South Carolina. It's impossible to effectively talk about the topic of burnout without giving a brief history. Stress was first introduced as an occupational hazard in the mid-1950s, and then in the 1970s, burnout first emerged as a topic of research, primarily in reference to the work within the human services sector, such as healthcare, social work, and psychotherapy. Herbert Freudenberger is a clinical psychologist, and he first observed the classic symptoms of burnout within clinicians who were volunteering in a free substance abuse clinic in New York City. At the time, the East Village had a very high drug abuse rate, and this wore heavily on those volunteers. Freudenberger began to observe the emotional depletion and psychosomatic symptom, symptoms among those clinical volunteer staff. The advent of the term burnout arose for the first time, and it came from the slang of drug addicts describing the effects of chronic drug abuse. Freudenberger's early work gave rise to Christina Maslach's pioneering research. She's a social psychologist from Berkeley, and in 1981, she first conceptualized burnout as a syndrome. Interestingly, it was initially dismissed as pop psychology. Though burnout has an American or origin, however, it's now uh, a phenomenon of global significance. So burnout is way more than just having a bad day. It's the result of prolonged exposure to stressors on the job. Simply put, it's an erosion of positive psychological state, and it manifests as a triad of symptoms. So the first is exhaustion, and these involve feelings of emotional depletion or feeling worn out, low energy, or having fatigue. The other is cynicism. So this is a feeling of detachment from your patients. You may feel less empathetic. And then finally, it's feeling ineffective, and that is losing your sense of purpose or meaning in your work. 
And burnout is portable. Let me say that it follows you everywhere you go. So if you think of Pigpen and that dust cloud that surrounds him, that's what burnout is like. It follows you everywhere you go and it impacts all the, the folks around you and with, within whom you work. Um, but here's the good news. Burnout does have a highest and best use. And that is that it can put you on the path of seeking more purpose. And it can be the impetus towards working towards a more fulfilling career. Dr. Esco? Thank you, Stephanie. So as you know, the worst thing you can say to a physician is you are ina inadequate. So what happens in burnout, there's this continuous cycle that a physician or a clinician can get caught in. Physicians are highly motivated and in the cycle, there's high ambition, which drives one to work harder. But sometimes by working harder, there's neglect, environmental neglect of oneself, family, friends, health. Studies have shown that doctors and clinicians are um, very poor at recognizing their own neglect. From there, <clears throat> there's the emotional effect that can occur. And subsequently, work demands begin to build. From that, it becomes a continuous cycle. Because of those work demands, ambition increases and the cycle goes on and on. In 1992, Tom Hanks starred in A League of Their Own, where he was a coach of a baseball team of all women. In one scene, he criticizes a player heavily and she cries and he absolutely loses it and says, there's no crying in baseball. The interesting thing about that scene, a teammate tells him just to take it easy, and then he yells at her and tells her to pipe down. And later on in the movie, he says it's supposed to be hard. Well, throughout medical school and my surgical training, we were kind of taught the same thing, that there's no crying in surgery. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's all a myth. It's not that um, the clinicians are weak or even that young baseball player. That's a myth. Another myth is that it's an issue of being unorganized. Some people feel that if they were better organized, they wouldn't have such burnout. Moving on, the other myth is that you'll get over it. It'll pass, it's just a stressful time, you'll figure it out. With all of the resources available, often it's thought that you can take a burnout course or even a 10 point quiz and that should solve your burnout issue. And lastly, the last big myth is that it's just a problem to be solved. Well, that's not true. In reality, it's multifactorial. There's lots of things that go into burnout. It's a system issue, not only with the clinician, but also with our environment. Clinicians are um, trickle down, affected by the communities that they serve. The communities are burned out. Our colleagues are burned out. The neighbors burned out, the guy at the grocery store, and it becomes a trickle over effect. And as caretakers, we shoulder a lot of that burden. The next is, it is a process. It actually needs a reset throughout the system, in the hospitals, in the clinics, environmentally. Work is a very important part of our identity. It's something that it's very difficult to separate. Most are very happy caring for patients and we do take our patients home. We think about them. It's unrealistic to think otherwise. Many feel betrayed by healthcare systems. In fact, about, it was a study that about 40% of clinicians felt some negative re interaction um, with a healthcare system. And many do not or would not seek time or seek help um, if prompted despite increasing resources uh, in recent years. So there's strategies to tackle burnout. One is balance, life, life work balance. By kind of putting a stop in that cycle, especially of neglect, self neglect, by adding diet and exercise and rest, whatever that means for you, but it's paying attention to yourself. Continuing social and family interactions, in work environments. It's known that clinicians in larger organizations and systems have higher burnout than some in solo practices. 
And lastly, the work model and system to create a stop in the point of the cycle. One work model is doing locum tenens as an alternative or primary or temporary solution. Next. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and uh, there's a couple of things that we often get questions about that uh, we'd like to clarify. <clears throat> One question is, is burnout depression? And while there's significant overlap between symptoms of burnout and depression, and uh, burnout is actually now classified in the uh, ICD code, uh, the 11th edition, um, it would be a mistake to make them equivalent. Uh, certainly towards the end of burnout and the cycle of burnout, uh, many physicians uh, and others become depressed, but uh, we want to be sure that the term is not over-medicalized because it describes a very, very late stage and can lead to the idea that it's a, there's a simple uh, medical treatment for this instead of the types of uh, complex organization and personal changes required to turn this uh, uh, epidemic around. Uh, second, next question that we hear a lot is on the next slide. And that's, can you predict burnout? Can you just do a survey and say, you know, this person is likely so we can just focus on the persons at higher risk? And the answer to that is that there is a burnout prone personality. Uh, however, anybody can uh, become burned out. Uh, these are folks just a little bit more likely. And uh, interestingly enough, these are the uh, people who are driven to succeed, who are perfectionists in pretty much everything they do, uh, put the, always uh, put the patient first and can be seen as a highly desirable type of employee, yet at very, very high risk of burnout. And this is one of the reasons, as we'll talk about, where simple engagement surveys do not always give you the information that you need. Next. So engagement and burnout is another interesting uh, topic. Uh, they are opposites in some ways, in that burnout uh, manifests itself, as Stephanie was saying, in emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, low personal achievement. And engagement is often a state of higher energy and dedication and a sense of high efficacy. And so while they can, the descriptions are somewhat opposite, there's another interesting tie between engagement and burnout. Next. And that is, is that there's a very well-known progression from engagement to burnout, which shows that your engaged physicians, those who test as engaged, are not immunized from burnout. They actually can proceed fairly quickly to burnout. Uh, the engaged physician very often, uh, as Dr. Esco was discussing, uh, puts themselves at very high risk by neglect. And so uh, this is a study that actually measured cortisol samples as uh, people move through these phases. And as their stress rises and their cortisol levels go up, uh, they, their work life becomes much more strained. They become cynics and uh, as the as the cortisol levels begin to drop and then the cortisol levels go down and uh, they experience symptoms of burnout. And this is why having uh, your physician simply engage in an engagement survey and thinking if I have high levels of engaged physicians, I'm not going to have an issue with burnout is misplaced thinking. And your engaged physicians are at just as much risk of burnout as uh, physicians who are not testing as being engaged. It's just a different part of the uh, evolution. Next. So the causes of burnout are indeed multifactorial. And one of the things we've seen time and time again is people looking for that golden bullet or that you know, magic panacea that they can institute and the issue will go away. And it won't. It has taken quite a while for us to reach these unprecedented levels of burnout in our uh, providers. And it will be a long process for us to reverse this and restore the joy of medicine. But some of these causes that have been found on investigation are, of course, high workload, uh, demands, high demands on productivity as uh, 
uh, physician payment has been essentially frozen for a very, very long time. And some of that revenue has been made up through uh, higher demands and productivity. The work hours are extraordinarily long, uh, something we're seeing even more prominently now in the pandemic. Uh, EMRs, as we know, have been designed, uh, understandably, to optimize payment, but have not all been designed to optimize the physician's workflows. And the design of many of the EMRs is rather poor as related by physicians and can slow them rather than speed them. Uh, many workflows are not well integrated into the physician's office. So medicine has changed greatly, but workflows have not changed uh, greatly. Uh, lack of control is a very uh, big issue, for, particularly for physicians, and that's often thought of simply as, well, now they're employed and they don't have control over their destiny. But actually, this lack of control in some of our studies has manifested in terms of they can't prescribe the medication they want because there's an intermediary uh, benefit plan that is going to ask them to change it to something else, or they have to go through very convoluted authorization processes in order to uh, do a particular test or study uh, that they feel is indicated for their patients. A general lack of rec recognition and rewards and how they are tied to the work of the uh, physician is a another issue. Uh, many physicians today uh, do not feel as though they're getting the same amount of recognition and respect that they uh, once did. And there's a kind of a general sense among physicians of some loss of community. They're doing more electronic work. Uh, today, they're doing more work from home. Uh, I have friends who have uh, tried to transfer to doing mostly uh, telemedicine and other visits and just find, find it somewhat depersonalizing compared to face-to-face -face visits. And even more so, we have more physicians today that work simply in their office and there's less opportunities to socialize with other physicians and share the burdens of daily practice. And then as Dr. Esco mentioned, there's a perception of a lack of fairness uh, and, and anger at uh, organized uh, healthcare. And for many physicians who work in organizations, they feel their values are misaligned. And probably the most dangerous is when the physicians feel as though their organization prioritizes the bottom line rather than prioritizing patient care. Next. So this comes with an extraordinarily high cost. And we always like to talk first about the human cost of burnout because it is significant. Uh, burned out physicians are at much higher risk for suicide and suicide rate actually has shown some increase. Uh, but on a more daily basis, burned out physicians are at much higher rates of relationship destruction, leading to divorce, uh, poor family and, and, and child relationships. Uh, there's a loss of reputation that comes with burnout because patient satisfaction suffers uh, pretty consistently. And that hurts the reputation of both the organization the physician works for and the individual reputation of the physician. Errors are three times as frequent with burnout, and the cost per error can be as much as $15,000 per error, but certainly some of these errors carry extraordinarily high costs. Not only the cost financially of the, uh, of the consequence of the error, but the human cost to patients of that error. And actually embedded in that literature is evidence that patients can sense when their physician is burned out and therefore doesn't tell them everything that they would normally tell them, and that also exacerbates the uh, problem of making errors. There's a generalized loss of productivity in the impaired, uh, burned out physician, and that productivity then also limits access to patient care for, uh, for patients in the practice. And <clears throat> the solution is very often seen as simply getting another job, and uh, doctors will leave to go to what they hope are greener pastures, and that cost of turnover for an organization can be between, between three quarters and a million dollars um, each. And we're seeing nationally rates as high as 10% annually turnover. So in a large physician group, that math can get pretty ugly pretty quick. Next. So nationally, it depends on the survey that's being used, but burnout rates are at about 42%. I think it's safe to say that a third to a half of physicians in the United States today are uh, burned out. Uh, next. 
And COVID in the pandemic is making this uh, even worse. Uh, in this study done by Medscape, 64% of physicians are relating that their burnout symptoms have increased since the pandemic started, and only 6% feel their burnout symptoms are less intense. And this is not just the physicians uh, who are experiencing the stress of doing hospital patient care and working very, very long hours, but there's been extraordinarily stress on physicians who have been unable to do their normal volume of work, even either due to uh, pressures on their office practice and loss of efficiency uh, or shutdowns of their office practices or simply a lack of access to surgical centers uh, for uh, practicing surgeons who uh, have um, have had those centers uh, shut down or stop or lower their percentage of cases simply because they need the resources in the hospital atmosphere. So all physicians are being plagued by this pandemic in one way or the other. Next. So what can organizations do to help manage this issue? Well, we feel that it's a it should be a proactive program of wellness for your physicians that addresses burnout. And this is going to be far more cost effective than initiating programs to try to rescue physicians who have already reached that stage of burnout. Um, we are over measuring our physicians. Uh, we're asking them the same questions year after year and they're not seeing any tangible results. Uh, we often hear about survey fatigue, but as we just talk with physicians, what we're finding is that uh, they're major issue is that the same questions are being asked every year, which is, are you burned out? And they're not seeing any benefit to answering those surveys. We feel that listening, Matt, is more important than measurement. And in this day and age, as, as physician groups have enlarged, developing mechanisms to be able to listen in meaningful ways to your physicians and then signal back that listening is extremely important. And the listening needs to be systematic so that the doctors know that uh, it's a program for them. It needs to be repetitive in that they uh, understand why the questions are being asked and they have a chance to give an up-to-date response. And they should be iterative in that they should be testing the interventions that the organization has putting forward to see if they are being efficacious or not. And then last but not least, uh, organizations need to develop a organized approach to fixing the problems. You listen, you hear the problem, and uh, we recommend using uh, lean process improvement and management systems to initiate the same types of cycles of improvement that you would in other areas of your healthcare organization. And that uh, once you listen to the physicians and you identify the prioritized problems and you should produce an intervention that they are aware of, and then you should measure the efficacy of that intervention and then cycle back uh, to another intervention. And now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Esco to explain to us how uh, at least one organization has been approaching uh, this problem, what kind of strategies they're using. Dr. Esco? Thank you. So as Dr. Moser pointed out, there are lots of organizational concerns and things with um, burnout that we've been able to identify. And organizational concerns, um, as we spoke about with EMR and increased workloads. There's also, as you spoke of, being feeling undervalued and not listened to. There's the sense that you have no control over how you work or when you work. The fairness and feeling heard and understood has been significant. As Dr. Moser pointed out with surveys, it's kind of the same thing over and over again. And just overall not feeling part of the team. There's that overwhelming emotional exhaustion that occurs with, with burnout and can also occur um, with the heavy work demands that occur. Also the isolation. Remember the uh, teammate I pointed out initially in the um, example where the teammate was told to pipe down. So the poor girl who was crying felt isolated. And that's very much what happens if a physician or a clinician feels burned out. They feel very isolated and unable to speak to anyone or actually how do they access resources that can help. 
these are, you know, just a few of the organizational concerns that arise, but we know that there are different strategies, especially with locum tenens. These strategies of the most important is that autonomy, the ability to actually decide when and how and where one's going to work. It gives you flexibility to be able to balance out um, your, your work and life sections by being able to spend time with family, friends, vacation. Also, there's income control. And when I say that, I'm, I'm actually mean that. You can work as much or a little as you want and actually decide how much income you'd like to have. It can be full-time or part-time or just here and there occasionally. There's that work schedule control. So if you decide you only want to work a few months a year or you know a few weekends here or there, that option is available. About being heard and understood and feeling valued, it's really great because at the end of each segment that you're working as a locums physician, you're typically given a satisfaction survey or someone's reaching out to you to see how the experience was. And there are immediate um, things that are done to help improve your experience. So if you weren't happy at a facility or you felt uncomfortable, those things are addressed. And again, you have the autonomy and flexibility to choose where you go and how long. The other great thing about locum tenens is that for a facility, it helps to alleviate burnout in their full-time positions by giving them time off. So it's fill-in staffing for vacation or holidays or even weekends. If an organization has increased patient loads, especially now in the COVID era or expanding service lines, they can reach out to a locums company and they can provide supplemental staff. I've seen that uh, personally, especially with COVID, where um, additional physicians are brought in to help supplement the staff that's there, to give them a break, and also just to help out with the um, increased demand of patient care. The other um, item about isolation, there's a WhatsApp support community that's immediate. So if you have a question about something or you're concerned, you can have immediate response that'll help you get through that situation. So what I found with locum tenens, it's given me all of these um, and more. Not to say that things don't get overwhelming because sometimes with uh, patient care, they can, but it's much easier to handle. And it's afforded me a work-life balance that um, I wouldn't be able to get any other place. Next. So that, that is a great example of an organization uh, identifying its issue, the issues and developing uh, proactive strategies to address those issues. Um, I know that uh, one of the best things in my career was when uh, we worked with our board uh, as a hospital organization and had the board give us blanket authority to hire a locums physician whenever a physician practice was in a certain state of call volume. And when the physicians were on call every third night for more than uh, a couple of weeks, they were automatically provided with a locums physician. They didn't have to ask for it. They didn't have to uh, come, come to anybody. It was just automatic at that level of call uh, that they would get support. And it made a huge difference in the uh, work-life balance of those positions. So it, it's really important to be able to organize those strategies and execute them as an organization. Well, how about the individual provider? Well, we think that they should be trained and in two areas. One is recognizing burnout in themselves and their colleagues, and then how to approach a colleague that you feel may be experiencing some symptoms of burnout. Uh, this is beginning to be taught in uh, residencies and in medical school, but for many of our physicians, this is just something that was never covered in medical school. And so uh, training physicians in this 
is a key to normalizing the conversation around this particular issue. The second thing is to give physicians real world techniques and strategies that work that allow them to begin managing uh, some of the overwhelming aspects of practice and also give them permission to take care of themselves as well. Uh, very often we talk about resiliency of physicians, but uh, I would argue that any physician who has been through a training program, particularly an internship and a residency, has already proven that they're very resilient individuals. What we need to do is give them strategies for self-care and structure around their practice and how to build their practice of medicine in a way that is more satisfying than what they have today. And then for those who need more, uh, private coaching and training has to be available and accessible uh, and affordable for them so that they might be able to get better training and how to uh, self-manage in a way that allows them to thrive uh, in their medical environment. And with that, we will uh, now be more than happy to answer any questions uh, going forward. So uh, we'd love questions. All right, thank you, Drs. Esco and Moser. So we'll go ahead and take some questions now. We've got a couple to get through. If you have some thoughts that you'd like to share or questions at this point, go ahead and put them in the questions box and we'll get to those as well. So we'll start with Mark, and Mark asks, um, can you talk about the reasons behind locum's tenens experience, experiencing less burnout than regular staff? Dr. Esco, that sounds like you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I will say this, so Dr. Moser pointed out that physicians are resilient, and um, I agree 100%. So when someone decides to do locum tenens, it's for a multitude of reasons. One, it could be just they're burned out. The other thing is just for more flexibility. The big thing is that practice type matters. And so having that autonomy and the ability to practice what I call pure medicine, because you're going in and just taking care of a patient without a lot of the additional administrative duties um, that would you would have otherwise in a full-time job. The other thing it gives you is tons of flexibility and income control. Even in the COVID era, what I found is that many of my locum tenants colleagues have less burnout. We saw that it was up to 64%. And I would, I would um, guess that with locum's physicians, that's much less, probably less than 50%, because we decide when and how we work. So that is, you know, those are a few reasons why I'd say uh, locums physicians have less burnout. Terrific, thank you. Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, all right, next question is from Tom. He asks, can you give examples of what has worked in healthcare organizations to reduce burnout? That sounds like a Dr. Moser question. Sure, I always, already gave one uh, answer, which is uh, the, uh, the intervention to be sure that physicians do not experience overburdening uh, call schedules, uh, which create exhaustion uh, by building in some strategies to do that. I wanna be sure though, in the context of this question, to just emphasize that what works in one organization is going to work in one organization. And uh, rather than uh, just thinking of specific interventions, it would be specific interventions to employ based on what you have heard when you have instituted a proper listening device to have that conversation with your physicians. But we've seen, we've had an organization in which the uh, survey identified teamwork as a major issue and particularly teamwork at the practice site. And so having the organization institute some specific training on teamwork within their practice sites has made a huge difference. And, uh, uh, and sometimes it's a matter of then re-engineering the processes within the practice in order to alleviate some of, the, um, some of the busy work from the physicians so that they can actually spend more time on patient care. Uh, it's been shown that better training and more enhanced training on the EMR is very beneficial to uh, physicians uh, so that they can master, as it's often said, if you're not the master of the EHR, then the EHR is the master of you. 
too many organizations provide training at the time of conversion, but they don't have a really strong ongoing program of training of physicians for which they compensate the physicians for attending so that it's not additional work onto their already busy um, workload. Um, training physicians and strategies so that they can uh, uh, think more proactively about how they're practicing and how they can structure their practice to optimize their uh, enjoyment uh, is another way that uh, organizations have effectively worked with their physicians. So there's many examples. The main point I want to I want to stress is that those interventions should always be based on a prioritization based uh, ba that's based on what the physicians are telling. Them. Exactly, and if I could just chime chime into that, a lot of healthcare organizations get stuck in the thinking that there's nothing that they can effectively do to address burnout because it is a huge issue. But there are there are things you can do. There are effective strategies, and it starts with listening to the physicians and the providers within your healthcare organization. A lot of surveys use closed-ended questions, and, and there is absolute value in collecting that data, but you also need to provide open-ended questions that allow your physicians and your providers tell you exactly what their day-to-day -day stressors are. And what SE Healthcare specializes in is making sense of those um, large data sets and really guiding organizations towards effective strategies or interventions that they can employ within their own organization. So there are effective things that can be done and we just want to make sure that that is heard. Um, all right. Stephanie, I just wanted to really back on that if I could, that organizations can really be proactive in preventing um, or lessening burnout by looking at their practice setup and their groups and looking at how locum tenens can help. I just wanted to give one example. So if you have a, a group, say of five physicians and suddenly two are out, by looking at that and being proactive and getting locums clinicians or physician in, you can prevent burnout in those other three because you're continuing to balance out their work life schedule. So one really big thing is being proactive and thinking about locum tenens as an option to help your organization. Yeah, and that actually, the, um, Lisa asks, in what ways have you seen healthcare organizations use the locum's tenens model as a strategy to combat burnout? So that kind of tags along with that, but are there other, mm -hmm. um, other ways? Yes, so there's another example where um, there are uh, some physicians, uh, surgeons who work um, all the time and their organization decided proactively early on that these physicians wouldn't take more than one weekend a month call. They're only two in the practice. So they have a rotating group of locums physicians that come in that are actually part of the organization because they're, they're on a continuous basis. So that's one example um, of an organization really helping out so those clinicians that are there full time don't have burnout because they know they Oh, I think we lost Dr. Esco. Hello. Are you there? There you are. You're back. Okay. Um, I'm not sure um, where, where I dropped off, but I was saying that um, by proactively getting locums physicians into the call schedule early on, it helps to prevent burnout in the clinicians that are there full time. The other um, thing is, in addition to call coverage and weekend coverage, there's vacation and holiday um, coverage that I've seen. And also, if they're going to expand a service line, so if they know they're gonna expand the hospital and have say a larger ER, then they know that you know upstream that their floors may be busier. So getting in locums physicians to be hospitalists or general surgeons or things like that can help immensely. Terrific, thank you. Um, Josh asks, healthcare has become so complex and is far different than the days of Marcus Welby. How can I possibly restore any passion for my career? 
Well, I guess I can take that that one, and and uh, I think there are many ways you can do that. Um, one of the one of the videos in our series uh, that uh, is part of our program uh, by by Dyke Drummond, the national expert on these topics, talks about how you create a vision for your perfect practice, and then how you can begin to think through. Uh, what changes you need to make in your in your current practice to create that vision? I think at times we get overwhelmed enough that we fail to step back and really rethink about what our vision is for practice and how that would make us happy, and then how we might be able to achieve those goals. And I'm not doing uh, this training justice because I'm not the trainer, but that's a simple example of how how this type of training can start to reset your mind so that you're thinking about your practice and your practice life in a different way and feel empowered to, per, to, proceed, to proceed with whatever interventions are necessary to start giving you a more fulfilling practice life and get you out of feeling trapped by your current situation. Yeah. I, I was going to say the same, same thing. Great. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Esco. Yeah, that's really great, Dr. Moser, about reset and kind of looking at um, your why of why you went into medicine and, and how you initially envisioned your practice and just kind of going back to that why and see seeing from that root of practicing pure medicine and working from there is a great way to kind of get back to where you want to be. Exactly. Dr. Drummond describes a Venn diagram and one of the circles is your actual practice and then the other is your ideal practice and in the educational series our educational series that carries cme credits it includes um, a way in which what he calls a master plan how to make those circles um, improve their overlap and um, he's very prescriptive in terms of a multitude of actions that one can take to bring into their master plan to bring those circles into to more overlap um, and, and create and restore passion for your career. So um, that's it for the questions. Anything else, Dr. Esco, Dr. Moser, closing thoughts? Yes, I did want to bring up one thing about passion and medicine. I will say that for me, practicing this way as a locum tenens physician full time for the last five years, I have um, complete passion in taking care of my patients because it's pure medicine. I literally feel like I can go in and take care of the patients, and that's my primary and only concern. So I really, you know, encourage people to, you know, take a look at it. It's, um, it can be whatever you want it to be. It can be part of your practice or, you know, occasionally, but I. I found that it's brought real passion to my practice personally. That's wonderful. I I agree, and and I I can hear it, you know, in the conversations that we've had, um, how seemingly happy you are with your career. Yes, thank you, and Dr. Moser. I would just close by wishing everyone a wonderful holiday and uh, stay safe and um, and uh, enjoy it as best as you can in these times. Exactly. Thanks to everyone who attended. Um, you will receive an email follow-up with a link to this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'd like to mention, again, that SE Healthcare specializes in both enterprise-wide and individual prevention strategies within our burnout prevention program and locumstenens.com also offers proven strategies to help organizations and individuals alleviate the strain of, of staffing challenges. For more information on each, I invite you to check out our websites or reach out to us directly. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, and we will see you next time. Thank you.